Thank you. Welcome, everyone here at Connection Point Church. It's great to be back with you. I also want to welcome those of you who are joining us online. Truly is an honor to be here today with all of you. You have a fantastic church. I love your church. I love your pastor. I honestly believe that um, you're going to be a church of 10,000 people in the next few years, not because that's your goal. Your goal is to reach one person at a time with the fantastic news that God loves them. And he wants to save families and restore marriages and relationships. And I just see all the ingredients. I just love your staff. Every staff person I talk to here at your church has a high get it factor. There's an excellence there. They, they love doing what they do. And you get to be a part of, of this fantastic thing called Connection Point Church. So great to be with you again today. Yeah. Uh, we do get to continue our series, thank you, called Done With That, based on a personal struggle that I've had with 2 Corinthians 5.17 that says, if anybody is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. The old life is gone. The new life has come. But if the old life is gone, why do I still struggle with sin? Why do I say things and do things at times uh, that I shouldn't. Romans 6.18 says you've been set free from sin. But not really. Just ask my family. They'll tell you. Any one of them will tell you. I'm not perfect at all. Far from it. A couple of years ago, I was on a 20-mile bike ride, and whenever I see somebody ahead of me, there is something in me that wants to catch up to them, pass them, and beat them in a race that they don't even know they're in. So that day I was on a long stretch of, of highway and there were two other bikers I could see about a quarter mile ahead of me. So I bore down and I caught the first guy, blew past him, but the second guy pedaled strong and steady and so I pedaled even harder, finally passed him on his left and I thought, well, I won that race. So I let up a little just to catch my breath, but a minute later he caught up with me. And as he passed me, he said, watch it on the right. And I was immediately irked. He irked me, bothered me, just immediately, just a flash of, hmm, don't like that. Plus, nobody passes on the right. That's just terrible etiquette when you're biking. No one passes on the right. He said, watch it on the right. And I said, never met this guy in my life, didn't know who he was. I said, you don't have to worry about me. And he said, you don't have to worry about me. We were in our little spandex shorts, tough guys. I wanted to bump him into the ditch. He was probably another pastor, a Lutheran one. And you can't let a Lutheran pastor beat you. And so I sped up past him, never saw again. But about a mile later, I thought to myself, Bob, what's wrong with you? Sin <laughs> is what's wrong with me, and we all have it. Got an email a while back, typical of many emails I get. He wrote, Dear Pastor, I need help. Every morning I start out with the best intentions to change my ways, and I think today is going to be different, but it never is. He wrote, Somehow I always fall back into my same old habits, like there's a tug of war going on inside me. I want to do what's right, but I end up disappointing myself and God. He says, I've tried prayer, resolutions, self-help books. Nothing seems to work. Why do I keep making the same mistakes? Why do I keep doing things that hurt myself and others? I'm very discouraged and defeated. Well, if you've ever felt that way, join the crowd. I have felt that way. Paul said, if you're a Christian, the old life's gone. But the old life isn't completely gone we all struggle, don't we, with anger at times, pride, selfishness, and other issues that we might have? So what did he mean the old life is gone? What's gone? Well, we touched on this last week. Being separated from God is gone because of Jesus Christ, you know, made us right before God, and so there's no longer separation between God and us. Ephesians 2 says, at one time you were separated from God, but no longer Gang, the moment you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are invited into God's family, and that will never change. You belong to him. So separation from God is gone. The penalty for sin is gone. You know, Jesus bore the full debt, the full cost of our sin. He took it all. 
Every one of our sins, yours and mine, on the cross, paid for in full. So the penalty, the eternal penalty for sin is completely gone. There are oftentimes lingering consequences to our sin. But the eternal penalty is gone. Bondage to sin is gone. We all still sin at times, but we don't have to be enslaved by it. We don't have to be in bondage by it. So all of that's gone. What isn't gone is our tendency to sin because of our sinful human nature. We talked about three ways to defeat our sin last week. Real quickly, we got to be led by the Spirit because this is a spiritual battle that we all face. It's something we, that has to be won in a spiritual manner. So be led by the Spirit. Be filled by the Spirit. We need His power to overcome the issues that we struggle with. Second, identify your signature sin. Most of us have a sin or two that we keep tripping over. Be honest about it. Name it. Decide that you're going to do something about that, whatever that might be. And then finally, develop new desires. We said last week that when you chase after God, he will begin changing your heart and changing the desires that you might have that are not good. Today is the fourth way. There's only one thing I'm going to tell you. Well, I'm going to tell you more than one thing, but this is, this is the key learning today. To defeat sin, we need to get out of the middle. Most of us are really good at avoiding the big sins. You know, most of us avoid sins like murder, <laughs> car theft. But man, we are masters of the middle. We don't blatantly lie. We just kind of shade the truth a little. We don't flagrantly use people. We just angle for favors. We don't commit adultery. You know, most of us don't do that. We, we just secretly leer at people for a sexual jolt. And we love the middle. The middle, is, the middle is where people often say, you know, I want to have a clean mind and pure heart, but I'm also drawn to certain websites, movies, and nightclubs. The middle is where people say, I want to save money and be financially sound, but I also want the latest toys and the latest upgrades. People in the middle often say, I want my kids to know that God and church are a priority. But they have soccer tournaments every weekend, so what are we going to do? People in the middle might say, I want to have a happy marriage someday, but until then, man, I want to sleep around a little bit. The middle is where people try to straddle the fence and have it both ways, but psychologist Henry Cloud writes these fantastic words. He says, part of maturity is when you can let go of one wish in order to have the other wish. The immature person, the immature mind wants it all. But the most valuable things in life, a great marriage, great career, financial independence, vibrant faith, come with a cost, and you have to make a choice, one or the other. That means you got to stay out of the middle. Uh, most winters, my wife and I enjoy vacationing uh, for a couple of weeks where there's a lot of grapefruit trees in people's yards, and I love free grapefruit. So when we go on our walks, which is a daily occurrence, I'm in constant search for new trees that I can grab grapefruit and take home on the plane with me. But it drives my wife crazy. Uh, and you can feel this tension when we are on our walks. Now, most people actually want you to take their grapefruit because it messes up their yard and there's so much of it. But I usually do get permission to take, steal, take grapefruit. <laughs> from their trees, but my wife's a rule keeper. So we have this ongoing debate whether fruit that's hanging over the fence is public or private. Does this make sense? I figure if it's hanging over somebody's fence and kind of draping over onto the sidewalk, that's public. But she gets steaming mad whenever I grab one. She boils over, she chirps away at me, and then she brings God into it. In fact, the last time, true story, last time this happened, she said, what do you think God thinks of that? I said, I think God could care less about that. She said, you just lied about God. I can't believe it. And that made me laugh, which made her even madder. And then she said, you're going to hell. <laughs> she didn't tell me to go to hell. She said, I was already on my way to hell, that I was going to be there someday. And that just made me laugh until I cried. The problem is, I want to live in the middle. I want free grapefruit. But I also want a happy marriage. 
But my wife makes it crystal clear, I can't have both. That if I'm going to take free grapefruit, I can't have happiness in our marriage. And so she says, you got to decide. It's one or the other. And I just want to raise a question in your thinking, you know, what might be your grapefruit tree? You know, what's that, that one thing, temptation, habit, website, or person that you're drawn to? But if you go after it, you'll lose something even more valuable. Gang, the truth is there's a constant tug of war between our old sinful life and the new life of obedience, so it's not uncommon to try to land in the middle, just kind of straddle the fence. A little bit of sin, a little bit of God. But Paul pleads with us. He just pleads with us to leave this old life that we've all struggled with. Clean break. Don't even get near it, he says. Live in the new And he uses an analogy of being a slave. Very interesting language, Romans 6, 16. He says, don't you know that you are a slave to one of two things? You're a slave to the one whom you obey, either to a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you're a slave to obedience that leads to life. He says, you and I, every one of us, are slaves to something either to sin and death or obedience in life, and there's no in between. Now think about this game. If you and I are slaves, we are not free to come and go as we please because we are bound and constrained to something or someone else. And he says there's only two options. Either you're bound and constrained to a life of sin, you're a slave to sin, or you are bound and constrained to a life of obedience. So what are some sins that some people are enslaved to? We looked at this last week, Galatians chapter 5. You know, there's the list on the left. You can read those for yourself. So what a lot of people do is they say, well, I don't want to be enslaved to these things on the left. But I also don't want to be enslaved to obedience and life on the right. Here's what a lot of people think or say. They say, I want just enough of God to keep me out of the ditch. <laughs> but I also want to, have a little, have, want to have a little sin and fun. So many people head to the middle, a little bit of God, a little bit of sin and fun. The problem is the middle is miserable. The most miserable person on earth is the person who says, I want to be a Christian and be good with God, but I also want to be selfish, greedy, lustful, and foolish. I want to party whenever I want, with whom ever I want, after all, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Stupidest statement on the planet. Because what happens in Vegas doesn't stay there. It follows you home in the form of you know the partying, the drinking, overspending, sexual exposure follows. these folks all the way home in the form of regret, loss, and a damaged soul. Now, if you're not a Christian, we're so glad you're here today. Um, If you're just, you know, asking questions about faith, we are so glad. But if you're not a believer, there's not, there's maybe not the tension in your life between the old life and new life because the new life isn't there yet. The old life is just kind of how you roll. But if you are a Christian and you're trying to live with a little bit of God, a little bit of sin, you'll be the most conflicted, miserable person on the earth, which means it's got to be one or the other. You're either a slave to sin and death or a slave to obedience in life. Now, let's just say you're going to be devoted to following and honoring Christ. That means you're going to be a slave to obedience. Doesn't that sound like fun? Sounds terrible. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be a slave to obedience. It sounds just awful. But hang with me. You can still hunt, fish, and play golf. Only you do it without sinning and living with regret. You can still work out, enjoy good food, and pack your carry-on with grapefruit and put it on the overhead bin and travel home with it, which I do every year with permission. You can still do that. You know, some people think when you become a Christian, you've got to become all pious and boring and give up hiking, biking, and fun. No, nothing could be further from the truth. 
You can still do what you love, only you do it without damaging your life. Gang, I would rather be on a golf trip with guys who are faithful to their wives, can't wait to get home to their family, and who love God than guys who sit at a bar getting sloshed, hitting on women. I'm telling you, they go home to an empty life and broken relationships. There's no way to live. Point is, if you're a Christian and a slave to obedience, you are not free to do certain things. You are not free to go to certain places, be with certain people, or view certain movies or websites. As a Christian, I am not free to be dishonest or flip people off, and sometimes I'd love to, or cheat on my wife. I'm not free to do those things. There are certain things I am simply not free to do, not because I'm a pastor mainly, but because I'm a Christian and I want my life to work. The most blessed people on the planet are those who are devoted to following Christ and obeying him. And God will, God will do things in your life and in your family that, that it's unpredictable and you wonder, how is this happening? The protection we have. The bounty that God brings into our life, not just financially, but in every way, even health ways. There, there's no other way I would do life because of the intimacy I have with my wife and my family and friends because we're all trying to do life in obedience. The Bible says when you're a slave to obedience, gang, it leads to life. But when you're a slave to sin, it always leads to some form of death. He says, when you are slaves to sin, you are free from the control of righteousness. It means you can do whatever you want. Free to indulge, watch, spend, do whatever you want. But he says, what result did you get from the things you're now ashamed of? Those things always result in some kind of death. Again, God gives us freedom to do whatever we want. But he says, the result of sin is always damage. So, as you look at this list, how many of you want the things on the right? We all do. We all want more love, more joy, more peace. Some of us live with constant anxiety, constant turmoil. And God wants to bring a new kind of peace and joy into your life. We all want the things on the right, then we have to avoid the things on the left. So I want to ask a question. Is anything dying around you? Because that's how you know if you're enslaved to sin and death or obedience in life. Anything dying around you, like relationships, you know, friendships, is joy dying or dead? Financial stability, your passion for God and worship. Nobody wants a life where things are always dying around them, but that means we are not free to go do, indulge in whatever we want. We need to become, as Paul says, a slave to obedience. Some of you know the name Alex Honnold. Um, Alex is an extreme climber, holds world records uh, in climbing. A few years ago, Alex did the unthinkable. He climbed El Capitan uh, without ropes. <laughs> it's insane, without gear. A team of eight climbers captured his climb in a documentary called Free Solo, and if you haven't seen it, you got to watch it. El Cap is 3,000 feet of sheer granite wall, the most impressive wall on the planet. Alex says, the hardest part that terrifies me is Teflon Corner. He says, it's like sheer glass. He says, I have fallen off it many times with a rope. You're standing on tiny ripples in the wall, one slip without a rope, and it's over. And this day, he was climbing without a rope. On the day of that climb, all his friends thought that this might be Alex's final day. And they were actually saddened in their spirit that this would be the last time they'd see him. Friends like Dan Osman, who took free soloing in a different direction. Dan Osman would summit a climb. He had a rope attached to his belt. And... 
the end of that rope was attached to another rope that hung between two canyons, and he would launch himself off the cliff and then just kind of swing. Don't do that. Dan Osman, when people asked him, you can see it on YouTube, they would ask him if he had a death wish. He said, not at all. I just want to feel the rush of, here's the statement, falling without constraints. Falling without constraints. But then I came to a video titled, The Late Extreme Climber Dan Osman. And I was sick to my stomach as I watched him fall and the rope breaks to his death leaving a four-year-old daughter. Because falling without constraints always leads to a death. Well, Alex survived his climb that day, but his friends believe a fatal mistake is inevitable because life without constraints inevitably leads to a death. Paul said, when you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness, But what was the result of that kind of freedom? Those things result in death. He says, if you're a Christian, there are constraints on your life, safety constraints. It means you're not free to do certain things or be with certain people. You're simply not free to do whatever you want because if you do, things will start to die. Maybe not right away. Sometimes it's a slow death. And then you wake up at age 50 wondering why you're so alone. So how can we win the battle over sin? We all still sin, but how can we sin less so things don't keep dying? And the answer is we've got to stay out of the middle. I want to show you a final graphic here. So we have the things on the left, we have the things on the right, and what a lot of people do is they they try to live their life in the middle. And I'm telling you, though, the middle is what sucks you in to the things on the left. You know, soft porn. Bob, no big deal. Who doesn't look at porn? Well, a lot of people don't, first of all. Second of all, this will suck you into a life that you don't want. Grudges. You know, Of course I have grudges. We all have grudges. We all have. I'm going to hang on to this one, though, for as long as I live. Really? That's going to tip you over into rage and anger and a life that you don't want. Buzzed. I don't drink to get hammered. I just just like to feel, really? You think you can handle that? I'm telling you, that's the gateway to this one down here, drunkenness. It's just, it's, you know, The Bachelor, I had to put this on here. I watched The Bachelor for the first time this last week. It's a train wreck. I mean, every relationship in in this program is an absolute mess. And you have to ask yourself, you know, how many episodes of The Bachelor, Bachelorette, can you, can you watch without beginning to think, well, I must... I must have to sleep with 30 other women to find my soulmate. Are you kidding me? I must have to sleep with 20 other men to find the guy. That is a setup for lifelong failure. This show is nothing but anger, breakup, wounded souls that will stay with folks for a long, long time. But people love to play in the middle. But I'm telling you, gang, The middle is what tips us over to the left. I want to show you a story of a young man, Adam. Adam belongs to our church back home in the Twin Cities. Uh, Adam lived his life in the middle that constantly pulled him into bad outcomes until one day he finally woke up realizing he had lost everything that he loves. I want you to watch this and I'll come back up and close. My name is Adam Lund. I grew up in a house where both my parents were alcoholics. As a kid, I saw the effect their drinking had on our family. My sister and I vowed we would never end up like them. But by the time I was 14, I was using drugs and drinking almost every day. My life was going nowhere. Everybody's rock bottom is different. 
Mine came on June 9th, 2007. I was out partying and was determined to get home so I could work the next morning. My friends had taken my keys, but I had an extra set. I was blacked out driving down County Road G near New Richmond, Wisconsin when I crashed my car. I came to in a field a short while later and saw flashing lights in the distance, so I ran in the opposite direction. The next day, I woke up in a barn. I had no idea where I was, couldn't find my car, and didn't remember anything from the night before. Later that day, the cops contacted me and told me that they knew that I crashed my car and they wanted to meet up to do an accident report and make sure that I was okay. When I got there, I, I met with an officer and he said, do you know what you had hit? And I said, a telephone pole or a tree? And he said, no, you hit a guy in a motorcycle head on and he's in the ICU. My heart just dropped. I was just in a, a daze, like I wasn't even really there. I had no idea what to even think at that point. So all I could think about was there's some guy out there that could die and there is nothing I could do about it, not a thing. And I just wanted it to be a nightmare. I wanted to wake up and I didn't want to live. I, I didn't want to, I couldn't handle that feeling knowing that I had caused that. So at that time, uh, I, I didn't really know Jesus, but I remember as a child, my mom would tell me if I was ever in trouble to just put my hands together and pray. So I, I was praying for this guy to be okay, and I was also praying for God to take my life because I just wanted out. And uh, I'd pray that same stuff over and over for about three days in the middle of telling God I didn't want to be alive anymore, he had stopped me and he said, no, you got to give life a chance. I'll be there for you. You got to get sober and you got to stick with it and I'll get you through this. And it was a big turning point for me. While I was waiting trial, the man I had hit did have a miraculous recovery. He did still have serious injuries, but I was very thankful that he was out of the coma and he was improving. I got sentenced to two and a half years in prison, and I got out a year early doing an intense drug treatment program, and I was really excited to start a new life. I kind of had a list of things that I wasn't going to do when I got out to keep me on the path that I was headed down, and that included not having any alcohol or drugs, not hanging out with people that were doing those things. I wasn't going to let faith take a back seat. I wasn't going to break any of the rules of probation. I also didn't want to date women that weren't Christian. I also had a list of things I needed to do. I needed to go to church every week, serve, go to AA, meet with my sponsor, hang out with sober people and people from my church. I found it important to create those boundaries and having those lists really gave me the freedom to live without having to worry about the decisions I had to make because they were already made and set in stone. It's hard to believe how much has changed in the 10 years since the crash. I've had to deal with all the guilt, shame, and regret from what I did, and it's been really hard at times. But God keeps showing up, and I could have never imagined the life I have now. In 2015, I met my beautiful wife, Bonnie. She is the love of my life. Together, we made our own never list, as well as the list of things we'll always do. Our baby boy, Locke, is six months old, and he brings us so much joy. This month, I got to celebrate my first Father's Day, as well as 10 years of sobriety. I am so blessed. Yeah. A couple questions for you. Anybody here need, need to make a never ever do list? Things I will never ever do. I will never ever cheat on my spouse or my future spouse. Just write it down. It's never going to happen. I will never ever over drink. 
And if alcohol is a problem, I'll never, never get near it. I'll never, ever spend money I don't have to impress people I don't even like. I will never, ever do that. I'll never, ever look at porn, mistreat my body, or do things I'll regret just to impress people. Some of you, as I say those words, are like, well, I blew that. We've all blown it. We are all equal under God's eyes in terms of sin. But just start today. Confess. Seek God's forgiveness, and he will. You know who would love to have you write a never, ever do list? Your spouse, if you're married. Your kids would love to have you write a never, ever do list. Your grandkids, if you have them, they're watching you. They're taking their cues on how to live life still as a grandparent. Do you have a never, ever do list? Never cross that line. For your sake, for the sake of your family, for the sake of your friends. Second question, will you, start, will you decide today, if you haven't already, um, just make a decision. This is going to be a new day in my life. I'm going to fight this signature sin that I have, or I'm going to deal with that. I'm going to do my very best to live my life the way God wants. Just make a new commitment. Do what Adam did. Confess your sin. Write some stuff down. I will never, ever do this. And these are things I will do. And then get after it. Final verse for all of us here today, Romans 8, 1 through 2. There is right now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Look at that. In this very moment, there is right now not a single ounce of condemnation, no matter what you've done, no matter who you've been with, where you've been. There is right now forgiveness. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for he has set you free from the power of sin that leads to death. What a good God we have. Again, it's been my pleasure and honor to be with all of you. Hope to see you again sometime. You're a great church. I love being here. God bless you all.